there were significant political, economic, social, and technological shifts in the last few decades of the 19th century and the first decade of the 20th century. The totality of these shifts amounted to a significant cultural change. And yet, as is so often true during times of change, some beliefs and practices remained consistent. Today's lesson reviews some of the changes and continuities of the late 19th century. Let's start our lesson with a look at political change. Historically, liberals had stood for many Enlightenment values, and yet, when liberals became politically powerful in multiple states, they tended to restrict the rights of several minority groups, the working poor, the landless, women, etc. As labor agitation grew worse toward the end of the 19th century, some liberal groups abandoned their agenda of political reform and, in order to preserve their power, they sided instead with more conservative parties in urging governments and employers to crush strikes violently. As the 19th century entered its final decades, workers organized formal unions, attracting the allegiance of millions of working men. Rather than gathering workers' dues and redistributing them in hard times, which many workers' organizations had first done, these new unions demanded a say in their working conditions, and they aimed to ensure that the wages never suffered what they called illegitimate reductions, and that wages would always follow the rise of the price of basic commodities. Craft-based unions of skilled artisans, such as carpenters or printers, were the most active and cohesive unions, but by the mid-1880s, new unionism attracted transport workers, miners, match girls, and dock workers. These unions were national organizations, attracting salaried managers who could spend their time planning massive general strikes and pickets across various trades so that the protests focused on matters that were generally important to all working people. A strike for the eight-hour workday, for instance, could literally paralyze an entire nation. From the 1880s on, the pace of collective action for more pay, lower prices, and better working conditions accelerated. In 1888 in England, hundreds of young women who made matches, the so-called London Match Girls, went on strike to end the system of fines under which they could be penalized an entire day's wage for being a minute or two late to work. Newspapers and philanthropists helped them tell their story and helped them win their case with the public. London dock workers and gas workers protested in a similar fashion, and across Europe, the number of strikes and demonstrations rose. There were 188 in 1888, but 289 in 1890. While the more organized strikes were a problem, the traditional leaders of the governing class, that is, the leaders of each state's main liberal and conservative parties, had often resisted calls for reform, sometimes by, in fact, passing reform as Bismarck had done in Germany. That said, workers, and especially urban workers who tended to be industrial workers, tended to feel rebuffed by the main political parties, and so these working men helped to create their own parties, the Independent Labor Party in England, founded in 1893, the Socialist Party in France, founded in 1879, and the Social Democratic Parties of Sweden, Hungary, Austria, and Germany, inspired all in some way by Marxism, founded in the 1860s and 1870s. While working women joined these parties as well, they did so in much smaller numbers than men. Unable to vote and saddled with housework in addition to their salaried positions, they had little time to attend party meetings and usually didn't have the money to pay party or union dues. In addition, many working men opposed their presence, fearing that women would dilute the union's masculine camaraderie. As Marxist leaders stressed that the proletariat revolution would eventually remedy the injustice to women, there was little effort made in addressing women's concerns about lower wages and or sexual coercion. In 1889, socialists from across Europe came together and formed the Second International, a federation of working class organizations meant to replace the first international founded by Marx before the Paris Commune. Members of this group were determined to rid the organization of anarchists who flourished in the less industrialized parts of Europe, Russia, Italy, and Spain. In these countries, anarchism attracted some industrial workers, but had the heaviest support from peasants, small property owners, and agricultural day laborers, for whom the industrially based theories of Marx held little appeal. Anarchists often advocated extreme tactics, including physical violence and murder, in their efforts to overturn the state. In the 1880s, anarchists bombed stock exchanges, parliaments, and businesses, and assassinated the Russian Tsar. 
Between 1894 and 1901, anarchists assassinated a president of France, a prime minister of Spain, the Empress of Austria, the King of Italy, and a president of the United States. It was these acts that fixed social views of anarchists as violent individuals who were married to a violent ideology. Members of the Second International felt that such random violence was counterproductive, and so they worked to unite all working people underneath a socialist umbrella for maximum effect. The proliferation of new political parties and the willingness of working people to use strikes to advocate for change did lead to some political change, even if reluctantly. Spain and Belgium abruptly awarded suffrage to all men in 1890 and 1893, respectively. The Netherlands increased suffrage to 14% of the male population after the passage of two parliamentary acts in 1887 and 1896. In Italy, an 1887 law gave suffrage to all men who had primary school education, which had the effect of expanding the electorate to include approximately 14% of all Italian men. Progress was slow, but somewhat steady. The most significant changes occurred in Britain. Both socially and politically, the Victorian era in Britain was a long and, in many senses, conservative one. Queen Victoria died in 1901, she'd ruled since 1837, and she was succeeded by her son, Edward VII. Still, by this time, the governance of Britain rested not with the monarchy, but with Parliament. So it was the changing prime ministers who actually had the most political power. By the late 19th century, liberal and conservative politicians had traded economic and political positions. For both parties, the platform shift was the result of their attempt to survive the era of mass politics and appeal to the working class, which, by the 1890s, had alternate political parties from which to choose. Liberals had stepped away from the laissez-faire policies in favor of protectionism, which theoretically would raise working class wages, and they also did include a focus on suffrage reform for men. Conservatives now advocated for a free market, which theoretically would decrease prices and help increase the purchasing power of working class salaries, and they used nationalism to inspire loyalty. Traditional political parties were put to the test in 1901. That was the year of the Taft Vale decision, which was a court case pitting a union of railway workers against the Taft Vale Railway, which had hired replacement workers when their union workers went on strike. The union workers engaged in sabotage, after which the railway negotiated their return to work, but then sued the union for damages, including the wages for the replacement workers. The case went before the House of Lords, which determined that unions and their officers were legally responsible for losses sustained by companies during strikes. This decision had a huge effect on the struggling Labour Party, which had won only one seat in the election of 1900. Suddenly, the Labour Party had a mission. They would be the representatives of the workers, and they would work to repeal the Taft Vale decision. They had a clear campaign issue for the election of 1906. In preparing for the 1906 elections, the ruling liberal unionist conservative alliance split on the question of economic policy. Some liberals still preferred to see protective tariffs in place, believing that these would increase British prosperity and bring higher wages to the working class. They wanted to create large imperial markets. Many conservatives, on the other hand, including Prime Minister Arthur Balfour, believed that voters preferred traditional free trade policies because they feared that tariffs would increase their food prices. Unable to resolve the split, Balfour resigned as party leader in late 1905, which allowed the Liberals to win a crushing victory in 1906. The surprise, however, was the more than adequate showing of the Labour Party, which won 29 seats in the House of Commons. Accordingly, the Taft Vale decision was reversed with the Trade Disputes Act of 1906, which not only relieved unions of any legal responsibility for financial losses during strikes, but which also legalized picketing. In 1908, Herbert Asquith became the new Liberal Prime Minister, but all eyes were on Liberal Member of Parliament David Lloyd George from Wales. Lloyd George became nationally prominent for his criticism of the conduct of the Boer War. Then, in 1909, he proposed what he called the People's Budget, which included super taxes, taxes on inherited and unearned income and uncultivated land, which could then be used to fund increased public benefits. The People's Budget promised to do good for working class people. As proposed in the People's Budget, 
these taxes would fall on the wealthiest families in Britain. Supporters of this budget, led by Winston Churchill, formed the Budget League to pressure Parliament to adopt this budget. The budget, however, was vetoed by the House of Lords, which had veto power over financial bills. Angered, Prime Minister Asquith dissolved Parliament, confident that the Liberals would win in the 1910 elections. He was right. After their victory, the Liberals introduced the Parliament Act of 1911, which proposed to eliminate the right of the House of Lords to veto any financial bill, and which also specified that any bill which had been approved on three occasions by the House of Commons would become law if more than two years had passed since its first introduction in Parliament, even if that bill was never approved by the House of Lords. This act was seen as a final blow to noble privilege. Obviously, the members of the House of Lords protested this bill, but Prime Minister Asquith threatened to ask King George V, who succeeded his father in 1910, to create enough nobles to allow for the passage of the bill, and everything indicated that George V would agree to do so. The House of Lords caved and thus eliminated its own constitutional veto, enshrining the House of Commons as the primary legislative body of the British Parliament. The Parliament Act of 1911 would become another document in the British Constitution. Beyond these political shifts, the turn of the 20th century was also marked by changes in social and cultural beliefs, which themselves helped cause the trade and worker unions and their ability to fight for their rights. One such shift was the role of the state with regard to education. Serious education reforms had first been undertaken in France with Napoleon I's introduction of the lycées and a public university. But by the late 19th century, most governments were instituting reforms. Reforms called for changes in scope and curriculum so as to make the general citizenry more useful in furthering economic processes. Governments introduced compulsory schooling to reduce illiteracy, and schools were also used to teach and reinforce social habits and responsibilities. Such compulsory education was important, but attendance at school, especially among the rural poor, was often low. Still, states now agreed that education was the purview of the government, and so debates about the best kind of curriculum were common. Bureaucrats and reformers argued about whether it was best for the most educated people to receive a traditional religious education, or a classical education based on Latin and Greek, or a liberal arts education including science, math, and modern languages. Back in the 18th century, Frederick the Great of Prussia's government had instituted a system of secondary schools called gymnasia, which prepared students for university and, theoretically, bureaucratic or diplomatic careers via a Renaissance-style liberal arts curriculum. In the 1860s, new Realschulen, secondary schools which emphasized math, science, and modern languages, were instituted. Realschulen were intended for students who could not afford to attend a more expensive gymnasia or who could not hope to continue on to university. So, promising male students from poorer families, as well as pretty much any female student who wanted to continue their studies, attended Realschulen. Generally, these students were aiming at careers in business or technical fields. By the mid and late 19th century, other European states had adopted this two-track school system as well. In addition, the idea of state-sponsored early and preschooling also took hold, and this shift allowed women to enter the teaching field. Curriculum at these institutions focused on Enlightenment ideals, treating and teaching boys and girls the same skills so that they might continue on to become responsible citizens of the state and so that promising students might go on to attend secondary schools and, eventually, university. By the turn of the 20th century, educational reformers weren't just focused on who should be educated and what the curriculum should be, but also on pedagogy, that is, on how children should be educated. Noting teachers' observations, some reformers argued that the repetitive nature of traditional education stifled the creative impulse necessary for true innovation. Dr. Maria Montessori, one of the women who'd taken advantage of Italy's willingness to allow female students to attend technical secondary schools, had completed a medical degree in 1896. And it was she who developed a pedagogy, which now bears her name, that began to shift how children were taught in Europe. Dr. Montessori devoted her early medical career to working with children who exhibited developmental delays. Eventually, she became interested in education and returned to school, earning a degree in philosophy, 
her coursework would today be called educational psychology. As she continued her research on learning, she realized that children liked order and schedules, and that they could often become focused on those tasks which were most interesting to them for extended periods of time. So, she developed a daily schedule that interspersed short lessons with time for practice, rest, and free play, and she noted that even children who exhibited developmental delays benefited from this approach. Her first school, known as the Casa de Bambine, opened in 1906, and its success led to subsequent schools and the spread of the Montessori method in Italy. By 1909, her method had gained international recognition. Dr. Montessori insisted on specific training methods for the teachers involved in her schools. This insistence, as well as other aspects of her method, were critiqued by American educational reformers, and while some Montessori schools did operate in the U.S., the approach was not widely adopted until after 1952. European educators, on the other hand, were more open to Dr. Montessori's methods, and in those states, even schools that weren't official Montessori schools incorporated some of her pedagogical ideas. The critiques Dr. Montessori faced in the U.S. and elsewhere, which were about her pedagogy, were often tied to her biological sex, to an inability to divorce a woman from just being in the home. Clearly, some social and cultural beliefs, such as the cult of domesticity, remained strongly held in Europe. Another pernicious ideology, that of anti-Semitism, was also evident across Europe in the world at this time, and a treason case, the Dreyfus Affair in France, perfectly encapsulates how widespread this belief was. Captain Alfred Dreyfus was the son of a Jewish family originally from Alsace. When, in 1871, Germany annexed Alsace as part of its empire, the Dreyfus family had moved to Paris, so strongly did they connect to their French heritage. Alfred Dreyfus decided to enter the military. He was selected to attend the prestigious war college, but his final scores were marked down by the test proctor, who felt that Dreyfus had some, quote, undesirable personality flaws. Dreyfus and another Jewish soldier who'd been given the same criticism protested their scores, but nothing changed. Still, Dreyfus graduated ninth in his class, and he was given a position as a trainee at the General Army Headquarters in Paris in 1893. In 1894, evidence from a waste paper basket of a German military attaché surfaced, revealing that someone in the French army headquarters had been passing secret information to the Germans about French military operations. Circumstantial evidence, it looked like his handwriting, pointed to Dreyfus. He was arrested and, while maintaining his innocence, he refused the arresting officer's offer of a loaded pistol. A hurriedly convened and secret court-martial found him guilty of treason. Dreyfus was stripped of his rank and sent to Devil's Island, a French prison island off the coast of South America. He had never been allowed to see the evidence against him. Despite his conviction, his family continued to protest his innocence. When news of the court-martial came to light, Edouard Dumont, owner and editor of a right-wing newspaper and a known anti-Semite, used the information to renew anti-Semitic attacks on the Republic, reiterating alleged connections between corrupt Jewish business leaders and the members of the Chamber of Deputies. Two years later, though, in 1896, a new Chief of Army Intelligence, Lieutenant Colonel Picard, went back over the Dreyfus file, and he determined that the handwriting in the note was not in fact Dreyfus's, but rather that of Major Walson Esterhazy. This new investigating officer, Picard, was, like the publisher Dumont, a known anti-Semite. But he nonetheless presented his evidence, assuming that the army would work to exonerate Dreyfus and to convict the true traitor, Major Esterhazy. High-ranking officers, however, let the matter lie, preferring the imprisonment of an innocent Jew to compromising the army's public image. Picard was quickly packed off to Tunisia, and a military court, despite overwhelming evidence of his guilt, acquitted Esterhazy. The matter was quiet for a couple of years, but then, in 1898, French novelist Émile Zola took up the Dreyfus case, publishing an article titled Jacuzé in a daily newspaper, which enumerated the army's bumbling in this case. Suddenly, the Dreyfus affair was once again front page news, as every political group jumped in, usually in the anti-Dreyfus camp. At around this same time, a new review of the Dreyfus case file 
found that new documents had mysteriously been added to the file. As it turns out, these new documents had been rather badly forged by Lieutenant Colonel Hubert Henry in the hopes that, should the case be reopened, Dreyfus would once again be found guilty. When confronted with clear evidence of the forgery, Henri slit his own throat. Seeing no other choice, given the publicity, the army recalled Dreyfus from Devil's Island in 1899 and retried him, but once again found him guilty, this time with extenuating circumstances, and returned him to prison. That same year, however, Dreyfus received a presidential pardon, and he was returned to France. He was not fully exonerated until 1906, when his military rank and pension were restored. The Dreyfus affair had forged an alliance between moderate Republicans, radicals, and socialists, moving the Republic as a whole to the left. The affair had helped convince radicals that they needed to remove anti-Republican officers, such as the ones who'd chosen to hide Dreyfus's innocence, from their posts. They also used their political momentum to separate church and state, which occurred in 1905. The government took control of all church property and assumed responsibility for paying the salaries of priests, as had occurred during the French Revolution. Parish councils now leased churches from the state. The hope was that the full separation of religion from the state would see a decline in anti-Semitism and other sorts of prejudice, and thus bring about a more tolerant France. So, the turn of the 20th century saw significant political change, as had truly the entirety of the 19th century, and yet some practices, like the relegation of women to the private sphere and the prejudice against Jewish people, remained. Despite these continuities, it seemed clear that the general push of this era was toward change, but what precisely would that mean for the 19-teens?